Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and ITY TV video. I'm joined today by Charlie Ferguson. He's the general manager of Asia Pacific at Globalization Partners. Welcome to the program. Alex, thank you so much for inviting me. So I thought we'd just start at the beginning and ask if you could tell us what Globalization Partners does in 2021 and you know, what gave its founders the idea to create uh, this business? It's a great question and it's, it's particularly germane given the current kind of market circumstances we're operating in. So mm -hmm. um, Globalization Partners is a business that was founded under the uh, duress of the traditional model of setting up businesses um, as they looked to expand into new markets. Mm. And to clarify what I mean by that is, in the more traditional methodology of getting your company to go from one country to another, you would go and set up a formal uh, legal entity infrastructure and mm -hmm. go through the whole process of uh, registration with all the various authorities and setting up payroll and all those great things. Yeah. And the founder of the firm, um, uh, Nicole Sahin, was, was really kind of flummoxed by the fact that there wasn't some way to at least get talent on the ground compliantly and legally um, without necessarily having to jump through all of those hoops. Mm. So she, um, based on her previous experience, having been in a firm that existed specifically to set structures up, she went around the world and um, the net result is, as we sit here today, we're uh, in 187 countries around the world and providing you know, thousands of uh, employees, um, their onboarding and uh, payroll experience on behalf of ultimate employers. So we have a local kind of vehicle, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in each of these particular markets that is running as we speak. And therefore uh, on our tech platform, we're able to onboard the employees really quickly and get these businesses you know, into the market uh, with a lot less hassle than is, as I said, is the more traditional route. And, and does this involve also the simplification of, you know, getting people from one country to another? Because there's tax implications, there's moving costs, there's all sorts of things, you know, that you talked about HR and I mean, it's, it's, it'd be simple, but it's, it's obviously not. Otherwise, globalization partners wouldn't exist. Uh, Alex, you, you nailed it, mate. Um, there's, there's a ton of, you know, I, I speak to a lot of uh, uh, tech startups as an example, mm -hmm. and it's it's super exciting and really sexy in the heady days of oh you know we've done so well in this market yeah. we're excited about this other market we're going to go for it yeah it's a lot of the, the the cool side you know putting the marketing plans together and building the go to market strategy and putting your sales teams kind of uh, ideas together but the banal or the more mundane sort of aspects of getting going are really the things that can trip you up. And to your point, if you're going to relocate uh, uh, an executive from one country to another, there are a litany of things that need to be considered, um, not least of which, as you uh, inferred, there's you know visas and all the appropriate uh, benefits that need to be applied. Um, and in most uh, instances, you know we take care of that on behalf of uh, our client. Mm -hmm. But moreover, uh, and this is you know equally important for, for the Australian market as it is for everybody else, we have a, a huge amount of talent right now, an unprecedented amount of talent in the world who's available looking for work right now. Yeah. So um, one could argue that there's never been a more interesting time to access um, incredible uh, sources of, of talent all around the world. But by the same token, we're restricted to a large extent because we can't travel, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this model that, that we're uh, sort of evangelizing is not only about hey, I, I think I'm interested in a particular market and I want to go into that market. It's also about, hey, I've discovered this incredible talent in a particular place where mm. I don't have a presence. How do I get this person on board and ensure that they're a full-time employee so they have all the accoutrements and needs that are met by being an FTE, but also from a risk mitigation point of view, when they sign a labor contract that's locally compliant and I've got my kind of IP protection and things in place so that, you know, as a company, even though it's a remote resource, it's it's all buttoned up for me and I feel much more comfortable about what I divulge and how I scale. Mm. So it's, it's, it's an interesting model. And you also got companies, oh, sorry, countries like Singapore uh, instigating their tech pass, actively seeking out the best of the best, you know, the people earning, you know, a quarter of a million dollars or more, probably exactly. more. And uh, yeah. instead of the brain drain, which is what we talk about in Australia, where people would go to America and other parts of the world and then hopefully come back in 30 or 40 years and try and harness local talent, 
you know, Singapore's right. trying to grab those people and say, come to us. I mean, there are people traveling, but only to certain destinations. And Singapore, for example, would be a, um, a very high quality, desirable destination to go to. So you must be helping people with that as well. Absolutely right. And, and you know, um, to put it in the frame of context for Australia, additionally, um, you know, I, I've been speaking to a lot of companies and, and some of the government agencies um, in Australia specifically about this idea that for, for maybe 20 years plus, there was this um, sort of the advent of, of offshoring. There was mm. this whole BPO kind of uh, wave that swept across the whole world. Yeah. And certainly uh, Australia was a stranger to those types of models. However, many countries, Australia included, are now saying, hey, look, you know, we have this unique opportunity to kind of um, reshore a lot of the work that we had heretofore put overseas. And um, one of the unique kind of impacts of the remote work evolution that's happening as a, as a product of the pandemic, if for no other reason, hmm. is that um, companies are starting to realize that it's not just, you know, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, et cetera, mm. that have great talent. There's also great talent in regional Australian cities. Yeah. We're all connected and, by our national broadband network now, or at least, you know. Yeah, the, the NBN is there, there and you've yeah. got, you know, my skills, you've got all these programs that are there to kind of bolster the capability and the the, the uh, acuity and acumen of what Australia as a destination can offer, mm. not only to uh, domestic businesses, but here, here was my kind of segue to this EOR model is mm -hmm. that, if there's a company in uh, Canada or the United States or in uh, the UK or what have you that is looking for really robust talent and they want to deploy a, a follow the sun sort of methodology to ensure that they're getting great English support and cultural affinity around the world, around mm. the clock, mm. by leveraging a model like EOR, they don't have to set up a presence in Australia to hire locally. They can just simply leverage uh, an existing compliant vehicle and hire folks in you know, in, in Cooper PD, for goodness sake, you know, yeah, where, yeah. Where, wherever, wherever you want yeah. and get people to work. And that creates this uh, concept that you just um, alluded to with the steam pa uh, the uh, tech pass in Singapore, mm -hmm. where Australia becomes this global talent hub. And that's a really, really um, phenomenal opportunity for uh, Australians across the country, not just in the big smoke to, to get to work. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have seen a, a, a tree change as people go to the regions and in fact, that has pushed rents up in the regions because people want to leave yeah, the regions they can't be locked down. Uh, exactly. But also, I mean, before the pandemic, you know, there were people like Telstra and I think Vodafone that had call centers in places like Tasmania because yep. it's lower cost and they were able to sort of guarantee, you know, fluent English speakers as opposed to people with an Indian or a Filipino accent, even though they tr would try very hard to have that mid-Atlantic uh, Sure, American sure, sure. accent. The, the, yeah, the, the uh, uh, accent sort of... Uh, uh, Blends. Asian, right? Yeah. And um, you talk about EOR, which is the employer of record. So yes. just explain, you know, the employer of record in a bit more detail. I mean, how does it work? Sure. You know, what challenges, what other challenges is, is it solving? And I guess one thing companies would want, want to know, you know, in a nutshell, it's obviously different for each company, but, you know, what, what does it cost for to, to get globalization partners to sort of be that intermediary, but also then to make life so much easier for that company? Now, th those are great questions. So let me start by kind of unpacking the concept of the EOR. Yeah. And then we can talk about some cost implications related to that. So um, in, its, in its very simple essence, uh, it does uh, what it says on the 10, right? It's we act on the local level mm -hmm. and in, in all those various countries that I uh, alluded to, 187 countries today, as the employer of records. So therefore, um, the tax authorities in that particular jurisdiction, or uh, perhaps it's a, uh, uh, an immigration and checkpoints authority or whatever it might be that's mm -hmm. related to the employment of the individual, when they um, approach uh, the individual as the employee or they approach us, we are the employer on record mm -hmm. for this individual. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds pretty simplistic, but of course, we've gone through this, this setting up our own structures. Um, we provide the locally uh, relevant and um, legally, you know, uh, uh, compliant labor contract, which is a huge issue. Mm. Lots of times when companies go to set up their own entities, they forget the fact that they need to have um, very uh, specific instruments in place for legality of hiring people in, in jurisdictions like China, as an example. Yeah. Um, so we provide that as part of the service. Um, we already have existing relationships with uh, the, uh, regulatory bodies like the ATO in Australia, uh, Fair Work Australia, et cetera, mm. to ensure that all of the benefits that we administer on behalf of 
the ultimate employer and to the uh, employees are compliant and are uh, up to date. You know, just a small segue here, but with the impact of the pandemic, a lot of countries have um, been very quick to uh, push through their their parliaments or, or their, their their regulatory bodies new policies in order to ensure that um, protection is placed in, at the top priority for their national employees. Mm. Um, not least of which there are these types of subsidies that have been rolled out. I mean, I know Australia's done a lot of stimulus into the into the economy. But where I'm based here in Singapore, we've done billions of dollars of stimulus into the economy, and so ensuring that the uh, payroll taxes and that the um, subsidies are being applied to the letter of the law for the nationals that are employed by the firm mm. is a is a critical uh, step that a company has to consider as they're entering into the market. It, it shouldn't be overly daunting necessarily, but if you're going in for the first time, I mean, it's especially if it's in a foreign language, it can be very challenging. Mm. So the the employer of record takes care of all of that. So I'm um, I'm assuming then that in in the Australian case that. Uh, Global, globalization partner employees, even though that they're the really the employee of some other company, but because they were because they were globalization partner employees, which had a local Australian arm, that yes. they were able to then access uh, JobKeeper uh, yep. payments. Whereas we heard, okay. for example, that um, the airline uh, catering firm that was or the or maybe it was to do with loading the the baggage onto the planes. I mean, not okay. the planes were flying, but because that was a overseas firm none of those and they were employed by the overseas firm none of those people were able to access JobKeeper. that's that's precisely correct and there are there are a number of instances that you would find where um a very favorable and very uh you know high impact kind of policy or uh labor tax or things of this nature that are germane and very relevant in a particular country mm. can't be applied because the um, parent entity hasn't set up properly, or they've been using contractors, which is another whole nother kettle of fish to unpack. So there's there's a, a, a myriad of challenges if you don't go through the correct process. And by the way, not for nothing, but if you set up and go through all the various um, you know processes and accoutrements of getting your business formally um, indoctrinated in a particular market, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, you know, God forbid, it doesn't work out. You know, you've you've gone into, let's say, Vietnam, and you thought it was a really cool market, you were going to make a bazillion dollars, and you set up, and you operated for 12 months, and it just, you couldn't get the dots to connect. Mm. That's an unfortunate situation. What's even more unfortunate is that now you've got to go through the process of unwinding all the stuff that you set up. Yeah. And if you thought it was hard to set up in the first place, wait until you try to extricate yourself from one of these markets, right? Um, it's, it's not a... Uh, it's not a bully system. It's just that it's a very complex, very bureaucratic process in most places. And it's going to require accountants and lawyers and tax advisors and immigration specialists and a whole litany of, you know, a cast of characters who need to get involved. Mm -hmm. And each one of those cast of characters has a beautiful bill to slap that on the table for you as well. <laughs> so the, the, the kind of the, the original genesis of this model was, hey, look, we're already here. We're already running. Our contractual designs um, are very elegant and very sophisticated in the sense that, yes, on the ground, there are employee, we're the employer of record. However, we have this back to back kind of reassignment of the day to day operations of the individual back to uh, the ultimate employer. Mm. Um, we call those employees professionals. Mm -hmm. And then we have our own employees that are GP employees. So these professionals work directly for us on the ground, but they report into uh, the executive management teams of the various companies that have hired them through us. And so it's all, you know, it's all kind of taken care of. Now, in the unfortunate circumstances I mentioned where it's not working out, or maybe, you know, uh, Charlie uh, had too much to drink at the Christmas party and he's going to be dismissed for bad behavior. Um, we handle all of that on behalf of the, uh, of the client. And this is important because in some countries, particularly where there are workers' councils or, you know, various types of, um, uh, you know, long service leave or things that need to be kind of accounted for, mm. obviously that's the onus is on us to ensure that we're compliant. Mm. And so the the uh, operator ultimately has the opportunity to then go, you know, very quickly into another market and, and try their hand in, the, in that market, as an example. And would it be the case that there are some companies who use your services? sort of in a transitionary way until they've set up their own offices and decide to handle all that. And other companies who say, look, we're really happy with the way 
it's working and we're, yep. we're happy to pay whatever commission it is that you charge to do this but you handle so many other things that they 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 permanently use you to handle yes. employees in many countries so you sort of doesn't matter which which way you want to go they're able you're able to help with that alex that's right and, and we're seeing a um it was you know heretofore it had been predominantly the case that it was a um it was either a a, a try before you buy kind of market entry strategy mm-hmm. or it was a uh, you know, I, I called out China earlier. I'll call it out again. It typically takes between uh, around 18 months to get everything set up if you're doing a wholly foreign-owned enterprise in, in, in China, bank accounts, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than wait for you know 16 months mm. to get kind of the business going, get time to value by getting somebody on the ground quickly. Um, but to your point, yes, there are instances that um, you know companies want to kind of maintain an asset light kind of uh, approach to the marketplace. Yeah. And particularly, this is interesting, a lot of companies these days, there's a lot of dry powder around the world right now. A lot of venture capital and private equity investment looking for a place to park. And um, as companies um, in, the, in the tech sector, as an example, go out and solicit these um, providers of funding, when they're able to present themselves in a more you know, um, athletic or fit manner, meaning they don't have exposed risk with a lot of entities all around the world and mm. a bunch of fat built into the system, um, they're much more attractive because it's easier to audit, it's easier to go to market, et cetera. Um, so therefore, yeah, they do use our model because they still want market presence. But they don't necessarily want the the bulk of, of the asset being uh, capital, capitalized in a particular market. And the other aspect of that is when that VC or PE takes that asset on and puts it in their portfolio, if they want to um, take that uh, vehicle and test a particular market, then they're going to use this type of model because to get to your question around cost, um, it's it's quantum's less money, um, uh, particularly in the immediate term, to simply hire an individual, a talent, and our fee structure is essentially, you know, there's a, a, a very minimal fee for sort of the initial onboarding, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the, in the neighborhood of, you know, uh, single digit thousands, you know, and then there is a, a, a low uh, double digit uh, percentage on the total cost of employment that we charge on an annual basis and that's it. Yeah. Anything else that would be uh, inclusive in those sort of uh, cost structures would be uh, required at the regulatory level of the local market. So, you know, superannuation or here in Singapore, CPF, central provident funds, things of this nature that are just, you have to do them by, by law. Yeah. But in terms of our fees, um, you know, the, the difference between what we provide um, and the level that we provide it vis-a-vis that which you would require to set up on your own is n- not comparable. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, an, an analogy you sort of can be drawn to is the serviced office space, but unlike serviced Perfect offices, uh, which probably didn't get quite as much usage over 2020, I mean, uh, you, you alluded to COVID before, you know, it's the yeah. It's the unforgettable, you know, 2020 <laughs> elephant in the room that it's still, it's trunk, it's still, <laughs> still reaching into 2021. Exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. But, you know, I mean, obviously we could see that you could, you could work from anywhere that you had power and internet uh, connection and a laptop. That's right. And so That's right. that, that would have been, you know, again, causing problems for the WeWorks and the Regis's of the world. But for you guys, I mean, COVID must have, because of the, you know, accelerated digital transformation, and the need for quality staff and, and people potentially even taken out through illness. I mean, your business must have been, um, you know, growing as never before. So, you know, how else did that affect you? And, um, you know, what else are you seeing in the market following that p- crazy, you know, time of, uh, of disruption, which, as I said, is sort of still here in 2021? It is. And it, it's, it, you know, pause to reflect. I mean, that was a pretty crazy <laughs> Pretty crazy. Only ten months ago, it feels like ten years, right? Well, there's still lockdowns wow. happening in in the, the UK. France just decided against it, but they're teetering on the edge of m- more infections. I mean, Absolutely in Australia, right. we had uh, lockdowns uh, in Perth just a couple of you know a few weeks ago, and I mean, the, the, there's more infections in uh, Melbourne on the sort of as the Australian Open is going. And if it wasn't for the Australian Open, they probably would have locked down again. And in fact, they I did delay. They, they did delay yeah, their I mean, um, go back to work policy because of they're scared of the virus. Well, and, and, you know, two points there. I mean, the, the, the lockdown that did take place in Melbourne was incredibly significant. I mean, mm. that was not, nothing to scoff at, mm. number one. And to your to your second point, um, the return to work policy scenario, and you see how that's working out, right? Mm. It's it's on Very the surface, it's a, it's, a, it's a great idea, yeah. right? I mean, we want to get people back to work and back into the office because that's what we're 
comfortable and familiar with. Mm. But the reality is that this particular sort of instance in, in our in our history has um, pretty dramatically pivoted the, um, the the power of the decision making uh, kind of away from the employer and to the employee. Mm. So the good news here is that for sure there are policies and things that need to be put in place, both on the tech side and on the more uh, you know um, uh, administrative side with respect to HR around providing the empowerment of choice. So, hey, look, a couple of days a week, we're going to need to have you come in because there's some things that just have to be done face to face. But by and large, you know, if you're capable of adhering to the following policies, then we're open to allowing you to work from home or, or wherever you wish to, uh, so long as you deliver. And it becomes a conversation um, about outcomes rather than the way that you got to the outcome. Mm. Not saying the ends justify the means, but mm -hmm. I'm saying that, you know, it's, it's, it's far more results oriented. And you look at salesforce.com, one of my previous employers, they just came out uh, with a, you know, their, their chief human resources officer came out uh, last week and said, look, we're good. You guys can work from home permanently. If you so desire, there will be some, you know, some leveling and some segmentation where people just by nature of their work have to go in, mm -hmm. but by and large folks are going to be able to make their own decisions. So as it relates to, you know, what we saw and what we're seeing and what we think we're going to see as we move forward. I think that, you know, you mentioned a great word, which is um, beaten to death by everybody, but it's still nonetheless germane, which is digital transformation. And I think what we're going to see, you know, for many, many years, um, in fact, in one of my previous firms, I was the GM of this region for a company called ADP, which is an HR and uh, payroll outsourcing company. Mm -hmm. And we used to talk about the future of work. And, uh, you know, that's such a cliche statement now because the future got accelerated so tremendously mm. that the impact of uh, robotic process automation, um, a little bit more of an advance in, in artificial intelligence, and even starting to actually see a little bit more mainstreaming around augmented intelligence and machine learning really starting to permeate beyond simply automating a process or uh, putting in place, you know, a, a chatbot, but really becoming much more sophisticated mm. And what this allows for, it, it does put um, inordinate amounts of stress on more traditional business process outsourced type roles and companies, but it also um, levels the playing field for a lot of smaller businesses because they can harness this type of technology and provide, you know, enterprise grade uh, client and, and employee experiences. Um, so it's it's a phenomenal time to be out here in the marketplace. You know the the region where I operate most um, predominantly, uh, you know, personally is, is the emerging markets of, of, of Southeast Asia as an example. Mm -hmm. And as you very well know, um, and, and your, your listeners and viewers will know, our whole region, Australia, New Zealand inclusive, um, we are the masters of uh, uh, necessity being the mother of invention, right? Mm -hmm. And we typically don't drag a lot of technology debt to the table. We typically embrace and grab hold of that which is most efficient to the market and can address the most amount of requirement and need. Mm. So, you know, you mentioned the NBN in, in, in Australia. I mean, I think most Australians that I speak with, you know, they're now looking at that as almost like a, uh, like a utility and it's become you, you number one, ubiquitous and number two, absolutely imperative to be effective in work. And so the digitization, the access to the internet, the, um, the speed at which we're able now to store information and disseminate information. This is being um, accelerated now because of the nationalization of a lot of labor forces because of what happened with the trade contests around the world. But moreover, when everyone can work everywhere, tech becomes the glue that binds the whole thing together. Mm. And that's really becoming fascinating. We all said it. But over the past 10 months, virtually every company, including every viewer that's looking at this uh, recording, has had to pivot into a remote capable, if not remote enabled business. Mm -hmm. And that is just, I mean, pat yourself on the back, right? That's incredible. That's right, yeah. Well, I mean, thank God we had the technology to do it. I mean, they were talking about teleworking right. back in the 70s when we barely had acoustic oh. couplers, you know, and, and exactly uh, like the war right. games type computers where they tell you the only way to win the game is not to play. And of course, That's I remember right. seeing these ads. <laughs> Whopper. That said, yeah, I remember seeing 
these ads from um, not that I saw them with my own eyes back then, but I mean I've seen uh, photos thereof of people in 1918, and the ad was like, well, we were in a pandemic, but you can still call people on the phone. But you could only probably call you know ten people if you were lucky to know ten people with a with a phone back in 1918. Right. You were lucky, but today, I mean, if we had this pandemic 20 or 30 years ago, if we had the pandemic six months, you know, uh, or two or three years ago when the NBN wasn't complete. Uh, right. or, or complete enough. I mean, the broadband would have been too slow. So we were, we were very unlucky to get the pandemic. We were lucky that it happened when it did. Yes, and, um, agreed. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's it's an unfortunate set of circumstances, but given the dynamics, you know, let's be let's be grateful. That's it. Yeah. Now, clearly, globalization partners over its uh, years or decades of existence has disrupted a lot of the red tape that um, you know various. Uh, countries put in place to make hiring of staff and of uh, setting up companies you know difficult more more difficult you guys have simplified that whole process but yeah. how have your competitors tried to disrupt you i know you don't want to give them any airtime but you th that must have also inspired you to improve your processes and become Absolutely. stronger yeah look a competition is a great thing um we were the first company to come out with this model uh, and, and as such, you know, we've been around the longest and we're also the largest, but mm. there, there is a, um, you know, there's a perennial challenge to being the first and the largest and around the longest, which yeah. is, you know, some, m many companies, uh, fall prey to the culture of complacency, right? Mm. So, um, to your point, yes, competition is great. And where we see a lot of, um, you know, uh, innovation and evolution of this type of model, which on the surface is, it looks like a very administration kind of centric model. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating now and, and where we're definitely headed, um, and, you know, again, I qualify that it's absolutely the case that our competitors um, in some areas do keep us on our toes here, mm -hmm. which is um, the digitization of the processes. It's the more specifically, it's really about the fintech side of it, because mm -hmm. you think about what we do, right? We're moving money around the world on behalf of our clients, and we're paying people um, on behalf of our clients. And that's not the old way where, you know, you got your pay stub on Friday at the end of the month, and you go to the window, and you hand it over, they hand you the cash, and they stamp it and give you the receipt. It's, those days are kind of over now, unless you're way, way, way out, you know, in, in, in the bush doing mining or something, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very much the case that uh, a lot of companies right now are, are disrupting, you know, every aspect of traditional, let's call it money movement um, with uh, the banking systems and digital wallets and, you know, dare we even go down the path of talking about, you know, cryptocurrencies and things of this nature. So the embrace of the blockchain, the embrace of the artificial intelligence capabilities, the embrace of uh, fintech to move money, not only from a payroll perspective, but from a, a um, accounts payable, accounts receivable, just payments structures in general. These are things that we see um, and that we are, you know, dead in the middle of um, innovating in our own uh, platform. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a really unique uh, proposition um, that our, our employees um, internally, our professionals externally, and our clients are all able to engage and interact on one, um, you know, global platform as a system of record that allows them to do, you know, expense claim management and leave requests and obviously get paid and even monitor um, the engagement and where their uh, employees are around the world and issue contracts and invoices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to constantly be evolving. And I think that the uh, robotic process automation and the AI um, investments we're making in our platform are going to pay off probably this year mm -hmm. and will continue as technology evolves to um, drive us to be more efficient and provide a better seamless and consistent experience um, for all those parties that I just mentioned, all those stakeholders. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that the competition is good in this region. It's, it's generally companies that are um, domestic mm -hmm. um, and where we're able to kind of add a little bit more differentiation is by virtue of the fact that we cover every, every continent <laughs> except for Antarctica. Um, although we might be there, I'm not sure. But we covered <laughs> we cover every continent, you know, in the world with a very robust network. Um, and and, and, and you know, I can go on. And, uh, yeah, it's 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 really exciting. We have 97 percent uh, client and professional satisfaction, mm -hmm. uh, which we measure every six months in the in the company. So it's um it's 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 going pretty well, you know. And we we make we aim to keep it that way. 
Now, um, you know, some people would think of uh, recruiters. I've heard of recruiters. Obviously, they're yeah. trying to help find uh, the right staff for the positions. And some of those recruiters also have consulting arms where they have a bunch of different, um, you know, tech talent able to sort of come into a task and, you know, become the emergency, you know, data center fixer uppers. Yeah. Because the, so do you guys also actively seek out people like a recruiter does? And do you also have teams of, you know, workers that can act as consultants to fix certain problems that companies are having? Or do sure. you do you or do you just focus on the administration side of things as, as you've described? No, it's a, it's a great question. So and, and it's it's a uh, it's precinct that you ask. So we're we're bringing services to market, you know, as we speak that mm -hmm. address several of those questions, such as the uh, the, the the talent, you know, uh, search, um, such as um, uh, the delivery of particular types of services or expertise. Um, I think probably as it relates to present moment in time, what I'm really excited about is, uh, particularly for the Asia Pacific region, we have an unbelievable uh, partner network. And that partner network exists specifically to address pretty much every aspect of what a company might require as they look maybe to enter a market or uh, attract and retain talent or some other aspects as well. And, and I, mean, I bring this up because as an example, if you're going into a market like, let's say, China or Vietnam, um, one of the key considerations for success is localization. And by that, I mean to say not Google Translate, mm -hmm. which is a great product, but yeah. I mean literally true. translating true translation, not transliteration, right? Mm -hmm. And bringing context to your materials if you're going in from a marketing perspective or uh, providing you know, the right level of translation services to interact with local markets, et cetera. A lot of companies don't necessarily think of that right off the bat. Um, we have partners that provide those services, you know, across the world. Um, legal technology. So, of course, we provide a legally compliant, you know, locally relevant labor contract. But what if you want, you know, some NDA instruments or you want some, uh, you know, partnership agreements, et cetera. We have some great technology platform partners, one called Zeagle, as an example, that um, provides those types of instruments across, across the world. So, um, you know, watch this space for our own uh, service offerings in the near future. But as it relates to today and solving problems, like you mentioned, we have an incredible partner network and I'm happy to you know, share that with people if they're ever interested. Sure. And in Australia and, and the region you look after, I mean, who are some of the big companies or industries that uh, have said, right, we need you, your help to expand in this region? If you could yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Cl Click Dimensions is one that comes right, right to mind. Um, and we also work uh, very closely, actually, right in Australia. As a matter of fact, I did a, a webinar uh, earlier today um, at Fishburners, which is the startup uh, accelerator there in, in, in Sydney, um, with uh, a company called Fullstack. Um, and Fullstack, uh, Stuart Reynolds is the founder CEO there, and they provide kind of accounting services um, and advisory for domestic tech firms predominantly, but also uh, those firms that wish to go abroad. Um, and, and that's, you know, the Australian market for us is uh, is a critical um, sort of bellwether economy uh, for our services. And what's really exciting right now, Alex, and I, mm -hmm. I say this not tongue in cheek, and I don't mean to like rejoice in misfortune, but mm -hmm. Australia is locked up for 2021, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it's the borders kind of sealed, yeah. as is New Zealand, your cousin across the ditch, right? And the reality is that in the domestic markets, there's a lot of opportunity. However, there's also a ton of opportunity abroad, but you can't necessarily go there. Mm. So you alluded to it earlier. Um, this unfortunate set of circumstances has um, been uh, a catalyst for a lot of companies to explore different ways to take advantage of the disruption that's going on right now. And by that, I mean to say specifically expanding into a new market or, or tapping on talent. So for uh, Australia, I mean, we've got people on the ground in Australia. We're putting more resources into the Australian market to ensure that we're able to shepherd these companies down a path that delivers the right result. And by the way, I'm not saying or evangelizing that we're the only solution out there that can solve your problem. Mm. There are a ton of different ways to kind of, you know, um, unpack the box. And again, I advocate if, if clients or prospective clients are interested in ideas, you know, that's our job. Our job is to advise and, and, and show you different options. We are one of them um, and a damn good one. 
but uh, there, there are a litany of different ways that a business might want to um, explore their options. So, you know, um, we're, we're a font of, of uh, uh, reference in that regard. On our website, we have something called Globalpedia, mm-hmm. uh, which is a free resource. You can pick the country you want to go to, pull it down, and read all about what it takes to set up, what taxes are like, um, employment law, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there uh, for free. Anybody wants to look at that. Now, as we get towards the end of the interview, I always like to uh, f- first ask about the future and what you think, uh, how things might evolve over the next few years to 2030. You know, without giving any secrets away, how do you think globalization partners will stay ahead of the curve and, you know, bec- be super relevant? I mean, I- I'm thinking, you know, in 2024, uh, I don't know if it's NASA or Elon Musk, somebody wants to go to Mars. I mean, you know, uh, in yeah. the next 20 years, there'll be globalization partners on Mars, won't there? <laughs> Could be. I wonder what their tax regime will be like, you know? <laughs> um, I think, uh, look, it, it's it's an interesting question, and I, I, you know, not to sound like I'm beating the dead horse here, but I think it's going to become more about the um, delivery of the infrastructure that supports remote talent, remote work, distributed workforces. And as a byproduct of that, yes, there's the market entry expansion story. Mm-hmm. Whereas heretofore for the past decade, we've been um, uh, riding on a wave of success, helping companies to expand to new markets, which is awesome. And we still are going to do that. But what I feel is going to be markedly different as we approach, you know, use 2030 as the example, um, which crazy enough is not that far away. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really going to be about the um, enablement of uh, access to this remote widely distributed workforce. And I'll tell you, we work with companies right now. This is a really interesting sort of anecdote. Mm. They are literally going to market with us as their, let's call it like their their underlying platform. Mm -hmm. And they're saying to talent out in the market all around the world, hey, come work for us. You can work from wherever you want. That's it. They might not have an office there. They might have a structure there, whatever. But they're literally using this model to attract talent and retain that talent because they know that the the person who's going to win is the person who has the best team, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The best product, the best strategy, the best tech, these are all great tools, but you cannot win without the best talent. Um, and so that talent, it's, it's myopic to assume that it's only existing in your five kilometer radius, right? Yeah. The best talent could be anywhere. And so that's what I think is going to you know, change pretty remarkably over the next nine years. And I think in that time as well, we probably will see more companies. It's like pe- companies in California moving to Texas. You know, we'll yeah, see we'll exactly see right. we'll see companies moving to friendlier jurisdictions for lower taxes and better opportunities right. to reinvest money in back into the business but also the you know the digital nomads as they call them the, the workforce exactly. they will also move to the best jurisdictions 100%. and um, so you must be helping a lot of companies with that too we are and and you know it's 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 fascinating you, you mentioned the digital nomads I'm, I'm also thinking that not too terribly far into the future workers will have uh, a national passport Mm -hmm. um, which will be you know crucial for various reasons as they are today Mm -hmm. but they're also going to have a digital passport that's related to their employment Um, and that type of document or that type of you know let's call it a solution Mm -hmm. um, will be a passport that unlocks a whole litany of uh, accoutrements for them it could be their tax residency it could be their um, you know their crypto account it could be their benefits their their medical records but i, I do COVID very strong vaccination believe. status yeah well there and it's happening right now right i yeah. mean a lot of countries are, are and and airlines are, are clamoring to kind of come up with a standard for your medical passport your digital sort of certification that you've been vaccinated and, and you and i both know and everyone who's probably watching this realizes particularly those of us who have been out in this region for a long time this ain't the first and it ain't the last pandemic mm-hmm. so you know um the way that we have reacted to it i think has been superior to a lot of other parts of the world because we just seem to be a hotbed for generating these things mm. so we've had a little bit more practice but it's um it's incredibly important that uh people remain sort of open-minded um and not fall prey to the paranoia around the big brother or things like that, because it's just the facts it's just how it's going to be and it's, it's not as if there hasn't been uh, vaccination passports in the past when when uh, absolutely right. you know i mean this is before many of the people watching this video were born, you know, yes. although older ones probably remember. But even so, I mean, what's old is new again, and uh, that, includes, <laughs> exactly right. that includes pandemics. So look, 
You mentioned a couple of previous employees. What's a little bit about your history in the world of tech? What was your first computer, for example? Oh, mate, incredible. Um, I had a Commodore, uh, and I'm trying to remember which model it was. was I had a the, Commodore, then a DTK, then an Apple II. Yeah, well, it was um, the Commodore PET, right, which was the computer in Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Yeah, I didn't then, have that one. Yeah, there was the Commodore Big <laughs> 20, then there yes. was the Commodore 64. So it was the Commodore 64. Well, That's, yeah, that was yeah. the computer that I had. And I'll tell you, it, it uh, the Commodore and the DTK, which was a, you know a, an Intel architecture clone uh, PC, mm -hmm really instilled a lot of uh, fascination for technology for me. And it, so much so that my first job, ultimately, um, I became uh, an engineer on, on the supercomputer division at Intel. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was on the uh, IA 64 bit uh, technology uh, team mm -hmm. um, designing new, uh, that, well, what was, what was then the um, uh, complex instruction set um, compatibility uh, with the uh, NT64 from Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, and started doing the first clustering and the first sort of non-rack uh, uh, server technologies. And then went from there to Microsoft, um, from Microsoft to Salesforce.com, from Salesforce to SAP, um, and then from SAP to, to ADP and on to where I am today. But the entirety of my career has been in either hardware and hardware design mm -hmm. and implementation or um, in software. So I'm a I'm a very, um, I'm a nerd when it comes to software and hardware, and I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, and, and, I, and I love it. And I, and I love how it's gone so mainstream that now, you know, the cliche statement that every company is a technology company. Yeah. It, it is. But the ones that really embrace that are the ones that are innovating around their competitors. And that's really exciting to see. And, and are you working on any hardware or software or globalization partners? Yeah, we're working on some pretty um, uh, incredible software. Um, our globalization partners platform that we have today is right now, you know, consumed by our clients and by our employees internally. But it very well could be the case in the future. We, we've innovated it to such an extent that it becomes a, a solution unto itself. Mm. But um, I, I also I, mean, are you doing anything? In, in, oh, am I doing any coding yeah. right now? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, I've, been, I've been working with a buddy on a, on a Python project, but I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you uh, when I got a little bit more uh, road underneath me. Sure, sure. Um, I'll tell you also, we've been working um, uh, one of my one of my guys that I hired is a uh, uh, a programmer for uh, robotic process automation. We're using some open source RPA tech mm -hmm. to build a couple of engines just to do some help for our marketing purposes, do some crawling and, and list compilation, et cetera. But yeah, it's 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 an exciting uh, exciting time to see what's going on with the access to so many tools, particularly with open source. It's really uh, what a lucky time to be alive. So my second last question is just simply to ask if you could please share some of the best advice you received in life to help you get where you are today? Yeah, man, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, my dad told me, he passed away actually last year from COVID, uh, ironically. Um, and one of the things he said to me, which really resonated is, uh, you know, it's the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm. And I recalled recently um, uh, an instance where I, I deployed it and didn't realize I was deploying it and it paid dividends for me. Um, which is not why you do these things. You do them to do the right thing. But um, I uh, I owned a jazz club in Shanghai for 10 years. And when I first opened up the club, I had restaurant staff at the back of the house. I had front of the house staff. And for the first week, they were just fighting like cats and dogs because, you know, the food was not going out the right way or the customer's requests were, you know, inordinate or what have you. So I made the determination that the best way to counter it was to flip them. So I put the entire front of house staff in the kitchen and the kitchen staff on the front of the house, right? For one week. Yeah. And it was a freaking disaster, right? Total disaster. We lost plenty of money. But the point is the second week after that little experiment, they all... silence, right? Yeah. A, a machine. And what it, what it came down to was, was very simple. It was empathy, right? Mm. So truly going out with authentic empathy and treating people the way that you really would like to be treated in my view, is not only a secret to success in work, but in life. Yeah, well, having the, having the, the both sets of staff understand the issues in those particular areas gave Critical. them a whole new perspective. And that, that, that flicked a switch in their minds after a week of chaos. And um, very, very <laughs> smart. I, I, you know, I, this is advice that I think more companies should take up and, you know, ride the chaotic wave and then... And then uh, You've got and then the pull them back in with says, lessons. You know? That's it. Yeah. And people do it, right? They send they send employees out to the field, uh, send them into foreign countries, and let them gain the experience and pull them back. Mm. Just inculcate the cultural sort of 
empathy that's required to, to be successful. But I, I think it's something that um, we shouldn't let the pandemic stop us from doing. Yeah. It just reminds me of that. Uh, there's a show on TV, uh, which I've never seen, but I've seen the ads for. It's James May, Our Man in Japan. And, oh, um, nice. I haven't seen yeah. it yet. I'll no, take a note. Yeah. No, well, I mean, I haven't seen it myself, but I mean, Our Man in Japan was, was something that go. was used before that TV show, but that's the most totally. recent version of it. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's the foreign correspondent. It's, it's all that sort of stuff. Exactly what it is. I mean, I even think of that horrible boss, uh, not horrible bosses, but the, the boss, the, bo- the show where they send the undercover boss, you know? Yeah. Undercover <laughs> boss is amazing, right? Yes, there you yes. go. That's a perfect. That's a great example. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's an Australian version of that as well, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, I'm sure that there was years ago. I don't yeah. know if they're still making it, but those sorts of shows where you get the perspective to be really no uh, seen is an amazing thing. So look, my final question is simply to ask you, what's your final message to ITY viewers and readers and to your current and future customers and partners? It's, it's a great question and, and I'll, I'll leave you with this. I think it's um, never a good time to, to sort of stall on your idea to take your business into a new market. And certainly that's the case right now. Mm. Um, you know, the, uh, the adage of uh, uh, buy, ho- buy low, sell high comes to mind, right? And right now there's a lot of disruption going on in the marketplace. It's, a, it's an incredible time to find great talent. It's an incredible time to test a market. And don't let the foreign aspect of that be daunting. Reach out to partners and leverage their expertise and go make a, a good go of it. Well, Charlie Ferguson, General Manager for Asia Pacifica Globalization Partners, thank you so much for your time. Best of luck for the future, and I hope we can talk again. Alex, I appreciate your time too. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.